minutes. Um, I'm going to get ready to start. So my name is Jocelyn Hurtado. I am the archivist at the Black Archives. And today is the second episode of Is It True? Tales from the Magic City. This is um, a session where I discuss different like tales and folklores or, you know, stories heard over the years about Miami. Um, particularly to the black community and um, today's episode I'm going to be talking about is called is it true that a black man owned a olden island um, during um, Jim Crow in the south and we are gonna dive right in so um, so that black man that I'm going to be talking about it is D.A. Dorsey also known as Dana Albert Dorsey and that island is what is now known as Fisher Island so I don't know. A lot of people know D.A. Dorsey being the first black millionaire, but a lot of don't. A lot of people don't know that he actually owned at one point Fisher Island, which is um, directly across Miami Beach, and is what now is considered one of the most wealthiest piece of real estate in the United States. Wealthy, um, wealthiest zip code. So. Um, a lot of people don't know this or a lot of people, historians or even um, local Miamis haven't heard this story because it's something that is kind of hard to believe. How can a black man own an island in during Jim Crow? And for those for those of you who don't know, Jim Crow, um, Jim Crow era is typically um, the era right after Reconstruction. So it was um, between 1863 and 1873. But the laws, the Jim Crow laws, were from 1863 all the way until um, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And Jim Crow was basically laws that instilled and institutionalized, institutionalized um, racial segregation all across the United States, especially um, the Deep South. And Jim Crow actually has his origin story in the Jim Crow caricature, which was created in 1828. And give me one second. It was created by 1828 and um, 1828 by Thomas D. Rice. And it was basically a black caricature of what white the whites in the United States thought African American were. So um, they they usually de um, depicted this Jim Crow character was a slave. He was a black man. Um, he was um, usually dressed up in rags with shoes, um, torn up shoes. He's dumb. They usually made this Percy as a trickster, unworthy, and um, this was the black character caricature named Jim Crow and this person um, this caricature was um, actually um, depicted in many minister shows and a lot of these white actors um, that's where they would put these um, they would put the blackface and a lot of people don't know about the origin of blackface but that's where it basically derived from is from this Jim Crow caricature that derived in 1828 and then um, the laws that you see later on, um, Jim Crow laws, are based on this origin. And all across the South, these Jim Crow laws were institutionalized to make sure that African American people of color um, were separate and um, really were hard to progress. And a lot of people, you know, Miami is a fairly new city. It was established in 1896, so it was, it was after the Civil War era. A lot of people don't think that you know, Miami was really, um, like these Jim Crow laws did not apply to them, but that they would be completely wrong. Um, these Jim Crow laws um, apply to basically every aspect of the South, including Miami. And that's why, you know, a lot of people think it's a myth that how can a black man um, own an island in Miami during the Jim Crow South? And that's um, something where I'm gonna um, give you a little bit about the history of. And um, so the island that we're talking about is called Fisher Island now. It was created by government cut in 1905. And the government, actually, um, the city of Miami actually created this island in order to create a straight way to Miami Beach. So the only piece of land that was left separated from Miami Beach was this piece of island. And the island was sold to Herman B. Walker in 1917. And this island was originally um, 21 acres, 
and his plan give me one second if you're seeing me looking or reading and looking down or to the side it's because i'm looking at my notes so all the information that you see here that you're going to see me talk about is based on my research and most of the research are based on newspaper articles um so for example i know that herman b walker purchased the island in march 23rd 1918 and then um, I'm sorry, no, that's when he sold it to the Dorsey, but Herman B. Walker purchased the island in 1917. And then the island was bought up by D. A. Dorsey, March 23rd, 1918. It was 21 acres. And D. A. Dorsey bought the island for eighteen, I mean $8,000, and it was broken up into two loans at 8% interest, plus 10 tracts of land in Lemon City, what is now known as Little Haiti. And I'm actually going to read you an article about that purchase of land because it's pretty interesting. And at that time, um, for those of you who are not familiar with D.A. Dorsey, he was a really well-established businessman. He, We believe he came to Miami right after its incorporation. Our first um, sign of him being in Miami is based on the 1897 Miami Metropolis News article, where he's appointed a board member of one of the local churches here in Miami. So that's just one year after incorporation. And according to the 1900 census, D.A. Dorsey was living in in Coconut Grove, which was the other black neighborhood in Miami and where the big Bahamian community was based off. He was living in Coconut Grove and worked as a fruit grower. But um, by the 1910 census, we can track him down and we see that he's already living in um, Overtown, what was um, previously known as Color Town. And we see that he's actually, by the 1910 census, he's actually a businessman. He has his real estate business. And he, pre in the previous year, he has really um, been well established and settled in the community. For example, in the early 1900s, he, um, he was a person who pushed for the first black um, fire department, for the first black um, color fire department, because in back in the day, most of the houses were made out of wood. And imagine how catastrophic would it be if a fire spread and there was no, like there was no fire department or firefighters to help that section of the city because again Jim Crow laws you know they made everything separate and usually and normally what is usually um, the black community also like they're too often um, suffer the side effect of it when it came to you know natural disaster natural disaster plumbing um, you know policing everything and anything in between so yes so going back to it, um, my point is that by that time when he um, Dave Dorsey purchased um, the island in 1918, he was a really well-established businessman. He had purchased a lot of land and built a lot of um, made a lot of development where he actually rented these houses or rented another community. So by that time, he was able. He was influential enough, and he had enough money to buy this um, piece of land. And now I'm gonna read to you an article that was published in 1918 talking about the sale of the island. Okay, give me one second. So in the meantime, I hope you guys are enjoying this. I hope you guys had a great Easter weekend. Um, I don't know what you guys did for Easter, but I cooked a lot. <laughs> All right. All right. So I'm pulling up the article. So this article was published May 1st, 1918, and it's titled Island Opposite of Miami Sold for Color Resort. Neger buys two thirds of key and plans to erect a hotel, bathing pavilion and make other improvements. And um, the article basically states a deal was closed today, whereas Herman B. Herman B. Walker sold to D.A. Dorsey, a well-known color citizen and owner of considerable property here, his interest in the island line between Norris Cut and the government channel south of Miami Beach, considering two thirds of the island or approximately um, 30 acres. Dorsey plans to form a company for the development of track to, of a high class color resort and subdivision with a hotel cottages for well-to-do men of his own race and boats of to to convey them back and forth between the mainland and the island so there will be so um there so there will be confiliate of races in the project the track carries um with riparian rights on both on both the bay and the ocean front 
One of the plans for development provides a filling in the bayside and the construction of a dock. In this way, it's expected the holding can be increased to at least 60 acres. The consideration was approximately um, 25,000, including five acres of land at Lemon City and several lots of two housing in the Pierre subdivision and block lots of, in north of Colortown. So back in the day during Jim Crow era in 1918, a black man who um, we believe who was born between 1868, right after slavery, right after emancipation during the reconstruction era was able to come down to Miami, start, start a business, be successful, you know, gather enough money to buy land. And now his plan was to basically erect a, a black resort where the color community can come and, you know, enjoy themselves. Because of course, during Jim Crow era, people who are black, they, they cannot go to the beach. They cannot go to Miami Beach or, you know, even like go swim across the water and keep be skiing, which, you know, if you've been in color, um, if you've been to Overtown, that's just across the railroad track. But people of color, even though it was so close, they could not go just literally a couple hundred feet away and go in the water. But here you have this black man in 1918 buying land and his plans was to erect a color hotel. But, um, so yeah, so he did that. But unfortunately, um, this, his plan never came to be. Even though we, I haven't found or I haven't seen any articles um, that says the reason why over the years, um, especially um, older researchers who come to the Black Archives, you see the oral history that has been passed down in this data is because the reason that hotel was never built is because the city officials did not want to allow this Black resort, this Black island, literally sitting right across Miami Beach um, to happen. So um, do, it says due because of um, political pressure and um, pressure from the city, D.A. Dorsey sold the island um, to Alton, the Alton Brown Realty Company that was owned by Carl Fisher for $40,000. And that is um, pretty interesting to note. So if you remember um, what I said, a couple articles says there's a discussion how much D.A. Dorsey bought it, some say $8,000, the other one says $25,000, which includes the price he paid and the value of the land. But um, the point is, I'm um, saying, even though he didn't erect it, at least I, in my eyes, there's a profit because he sold it for forty thousand dollars. And this is according to a listing that was um, published in the news article, December second, nineteen nineteen. It says D.A. Dorsey to Alton Beach Realty Company, um, forty thousand dollars parts of sector. It gives you the the sector number, and it's twenty one acres. And this was published in the Miami News. So yeah, so because of Jim Crow, um, D.A. Dorsey was not able to um, build this hotel, but that didn't stop D.A. Dorsey at the time from doing whatever he, like whatever he could in order to, you know, make things happen for his community. Um, for example, kind of like to bring it around, um, kind of tie it into today's situation. I actually found when while I was researching this, I found other articles talking about D.A. Dorsey. And one of the articles that I found really interesting and kind of ironic was that, let me see. Um, yeah, you like I'm reading out the comments. So I'm seeing the historic Black Precinct, which is um, located in Overtown. Hey, Terrence. Um, it says, you cannot even buy... Um, 40k is less than some people pay for a car it is you cannot even buy apartment here so you can imagine $40,000 back in 1918 I don't know what the conversion is but if you guys are interested you guys can do um, some research and see what that is in today's money so um, okay give me one second and pulling okay so I found the article so Kind of to bring it around in today's situation, you know, the purpose of these online segments is to, you know, be safer at home, keep you guys entertained, and make sure that you guys are learning something new while we're here, and just, you know, making sure this history is not forgotten. And um, kind of to bring it around to today's situation, while I was doing research for the Dave Dorsey um, when he purchased the island, I actually found another article titled, um, urgent need for more nurses and this was published Monday October 14 1918 and it basically talks about the influenza epidemic so um, 
It talks about the influenza epidemic and the impact in the South Florida uh, Black community. In particular, it says um, there's a segment that's called the color situation. It says, although a number of new cases of influenza developed among the color residents yesterday, the situation in that section of the city was um, not center, alarm. but it also states that a 25 room temporary hotel has been donated by DA Dorsey and other quarters had been secure in order to attend the color patients. So I thought it was pretty interesting given, you know, what we're living through now, but during that time of need during another, um, health pandemic, you know, DA Dorsey literally made sure that, you know, there, the, his community was going to be taken care of and he donated, you know, a hotel. So these hotel quarters, so they can be attended to. And that hotel was actually the Crescent Hotel that was owned by D.A. Dorsey. So I see a couple of questions. It says, is there a place card or any reference to D.A. Dorsey on Fisher Island? I do not know of any place card or reference on the island, but I do know that a court, they do mention D.A. Dorsey. They do talk about his purchase when he was the owner on their website is the fisherislandclub.com history so it, they do talk about um d dorsey owning the island and another interesting thing that I, I while i was looking at the history of the island you know d dorsey owned the island approximately over a little bit of over a year but then herman b walker he also owned the island not a long time and let me just go over to um a little bit about the history so herman b walker did not own the island a long time he D. A. Dorsey sold it in 1919, but by let me get the date right. So by nine, I think by the end of the 1919, oh no, okay, by 1927, um, Carl Fisher actually, the he did a trade for the island to um to one of the Vanderbilts. It was, give me one second. It was. Da, da, da. William Kissam Vanderbilt, who was the great great grandson of Cornelius Vanderbilt, of you know the Vanderbilt who built their fortune on the railroad and shipping, so he sold it to. Um, he actually traded it for uh, Mr. Vanderbilt's two hundred sixty foot yacht. So um, the um, Carl Fisher sold the island to um, the Vanderbilt. And then the Vanderbilt actually lived there for a couple years, and he actually built a an estate there and um, developed the island until night in the owned the island until 1944. And let's see, yeah, the Vanderbilt actually owned the land more than Carl Fisher, but why is it called Fisher Island? I don't know, but the Vanderbilt owned the island a great um, more time than Carl Fisher did. And so they lived there for 25 years and then, um, couple, I mean, not 25 years. Um, the Vanderbilts then sold the island to Edward S. Moore, who made his money off his deal. But then he, they, they, he sold the island to Garfield Woods, um, who lived there for 25 years. And then in 1963, Mr. Woods sold the estate to an investment group. And then you see in the early 90s, the island being vault, um, being bought by another investment group and being developed. But, um, yeah, so if you want to learn more about the history about the Action Island and the other owners of the island, I would suggest going to their website. But they do mention Dean Dorsey that he was the island and he's lauded as Miami's first black millionaire. But they do not mention the reason why the island was sold. But there, I think there should definitely be a place card um, stating, you know, he was um, the second owner of that island. Yeah. And, okay. So for those of you who don't know who D.A. Dorsey, what he looks like, this is him. This is, you know, I printed out this picture. It's not as good. But this is actually the only picture of D.A. Dorsey that you know, I've known or come across. So if you know anybody who has another picture of D.A. Dorsey, please tell them to send it to the archives. And this is what the island looked like back in 1919. I don't know if you guys can see this. So for example, this is the island and this is Miami Beach. So his plan was to build a black resort right here and then there will be a ferry that would transport the guests from the mainland to the island. 
but you see how close in proximity it is, you know, Miami Beach to the island. So you can see, like, it's not hard to guess why some city officials would not like a black um, resort right across from it. But I want you to let you guys know that this did not stop Mr. D. Dorsey. You know, he continued doing business. He continued um, opening up business and helping out the community. And I don't want to get too much into the history of D. Dorsey because later on this week, on Friday, our virtual field trip hosted by the executive director, Timothy Barber, he's going to be actually taking you to the D. Dorsey house, the historic D. Dorsey house, which is open as a museum well not currently because of the situation but you guys are going to be able to see it virtually and um, you guys are going to be learning more, a little bit more about his business endeavors his family life which is really really interesting and this information i gather over a couple of months um, um last in 2018 the d dorsey historic d dorsey house was open as a museum and it's pretty interesting i love doing research because you're kind of playing detective and you're going back through history and kind of piecing the puzzles together and trying to find out about this person like you know i've never met have no con direct connections to him but here i am trying to find everything about um uh, this person's life and it's pretty interesting and fascinating because you know this is how history stories are kept alive and so that is basically it. So that's how, yes, is it true? Uh, a black man owned a, an island during um, Jim Crow in the South. It is true. He did own an island and he owned so much more. Um, I don't want to get into it, but I also want to let you guys know he owned a hotel, several businesses, and he actually had a couple, he actually had a patent. I'm not going to tell you, you know, what type of pattern it was, but he actually patterned like a part for uh, means of transportation, which I thought it was pretty cool. So um, if I actually want to see who knows what, does anybody know where D.A. Dorsey was born? Does anybody know where D.A. Dorsey was born? No one, take a guess. He was not a native Miamian. He traveled, it is said that he traveled um, by the FEC, which is the Florida East Coast Railroad Line. Does anybody know where Dia Dorsey was born? No. Well, he was born, yeah, he was born in Quitman, Georgia. Yeah, he was born in Quitman, Georgia, um, which is right um, near the Florida Georgia border. And it is said that he traveled as a carpenter um, working on the FEC line, which was owned by, um, oh God, owned by, I'm getting like, uh, damn, it's, it's escaping me. It's owned by Flagler, Henry, Henry Flagler. So yeah. And okay, so I have a comment says to get into, oh, okay, so I think this is in reference to some of the businesses and some of the other involvement, business involvement that Dave Dorsey was involved in. And um, he was, he actually patterned an airplane part. And in the Dave Dorsey house, we actually have um, print out of copies of the patent that was um I believe was in the mid 1900. It was actually for an airplane part. Um, I'm, and when we go to the field trip, I'm gonna ask uh, the virtual field trip. I'm gonna ask Mr. Barber to zoom in on the patent. And the original paper are actually housed at the FIU repository. But we have a little bit more. Uh, we have information on the patent. He did have it for a couple years, and then he sold it. And then an interesting thing about Mr. D. Dorsey, his business was just not localized here to the South Florida area, even though this is where he called home base. He actually did business in the Caribbean. We actually have shipping records which shows that he was um, going to Cuba, doing business, and then coming back through the port, Key West port, and then coming back to Miami. And then we also have, we found some newspaper articles talking about his political involvement, where it shows that he went to a Republican, Republican convention in the 1920s in Chicago, and he was basically um, the point person, the point, um, the black um, point person for that um, conference, uh, at least regarding to the South Florida area. So he was literally had his hand in everything. And 
I, I think it's fascinating about D. Dorsey that you always find new information. A lot of information that I get it from is from newspapers.com, which has the digitized newspapers. And it talks about, you know, his businesses, what his dealing was. And let me see if I can tell you guys something more. Um, other interesting things. Okay. I uh, Let me see. So, okay. I wanted, I wanted to tell you, I'll talk to you a little bit about Jim Crow in the South, particularly to Miami, because a lot of people think of Miami, but the melting pot it is today, people from all different um, cultural, ethnic background, and, you know, they tend to forget Miami was part of the Deep South. It was Dixieland. And, you know, because of Jim Crow, the color community was really needed to argue for their fair share of like even to live properly properly for example there is a news article give me a second okay there is a news article um let me zoom in Okay, so there is a news article that basically says that, um, give me a second, the Wi-Fi is kind of acting up. There is a news article that basically said that, um, between like 1905 and like 1915 you know the color community basically had to tell the city councils we need running water we need electricity um we don't have any of these like you know what you need to have um like standard living conditions and they basically argued to the city councils that you know this is what they needed and i also want to talk to you about like I'm, i can do several like episode on dia dorsey um, that it's really interesting. It's not particular to the island, but um, particular to the D.A. Dorsey Park. So the park was purchased by D.A. Dorsey um, in the mid-1900s, and the plan was to sell the park. There was a, a movement to make a color park for the, for the color residents of Miami. So the city, the city agreed to buy this piece of land to D.A. Dorsey, um, D.A. Dor it was agreed that D.A. Dorsey was going to give them the land in exchange, um, for $7,000. So once they, 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 they agreed to the deal, um, a couple of months afterwards, D.A. Dorsey said nothing has been done. You know, you guys said that you were guys going to buy the land to the city of Miami, but they didn't. And, you know, at that time, prior to that, D.A. Dorsey bought that land knowing that his future plans was to become a park, but he still, he used his own money. He used his own money, five thousand dollars plus interest, to buy this land. To later, it was agreed to be um, sold to the park, um, to the city of Miami. But the city of Miami did not honor that deal, and literally, D. A. Dorsey had to fight with the city of Miami in order for the deal to go through. Because um, you know, at the same time, D. A. Dorsey was losing money. So, for example, there's a Miami um, Herald News article titled May Fourth, nineteen seventeen. It says, site offered by D.A. Dorsey for $7,000 near the gas plant is finally accepted. And then there's other follow-up articles that says, a city not to pay for Negro Park until bonds are sold. So basically the city is telling D.A. Dorsey, hey, we don't have the money. Uh, we can't give you the money until these bonds are sold for the park. So in the meantime, you're going to have to, you know, that's your expense. And then, and that was... Um, August 11th, 1917, and then on August 13th, there's kind of like a scathing newspaper, a news article, um, basically calling out the, like, the city's council, like, council inefficiency, saying that it's the worst, how, like, how can, you know, they go back on this deal with D.A. Dorsey, not giving him the money, knowing that, you know, he basically purchased this land in order to sell it to the city, and, you know, D.A. Dorsey, even though he's a person of color, he's a taxpayer like any other member of the city who actually, he probably pays more taxes than, you know, the common um, white man. And how can he be treated this way? And that, you know, just because of his race, you know, people are, like the city council was able to get away from it. But it's basically like really reprehensible. 
and that um, they had wronged Dorsey. So this is a pretty new um, newspaper article. And just to let you guys know, everything that I'm going to be talking about or cite, this newspaper article, um, uh, it's once we reopen, eventually it's going to be stored at the Black Archive. So if you want to continue doing more researcher research, please do so.